section twelve of american big game hunting a collection of stories by the boone and crockett club this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org american big game hunting section twelve in buffalo days by george bird grinnell part two although only one species of buffalo is known to science old mountaineers and indians tell of four kinds these are besides the ordinary animal of the plains the mountain buffalo sometimes called bison which is found in the timbered rocky mountains the wood buffalo of the northwest which inhabits the timbered country to the west and north of athabasca lake and the beaver buffalo the last named has been vaguely described to me by northern indians as small and having a very curly coat i know of only one printed account of it and this says that it had quote, short sharp horns which were small at the root and curiously turned up and bent backward not unlike a ram's but quite unlike the bend of the horn in the common buffalo End quote it is possible that this description may refer to the musk ox and not to the buffalo the mountain and wood buffalo seem to be very much alike in habit and appearance they are larger darker and heavier than the animal of the plains but there is no reason for thinking them specifically distinct from it such differences as exist are due to conditions of environment the color of the buffalo in its new coat is a dark liver brown this soon changes however and the hides which are at their best in november and early december begin to grow paler towards spring and when the coat is shed the hair and wool from young animals is almost a dark smoky gray the calf when just born is of a bright yellow color almost a pale red on the line of the back as it grows older it becomes darker and by late autumn is almost as dark as the adults variations from the normal color are very rare but pied spotted and roan animals are sometimes killed blue or mouse-colored buffalo were occasionally seen and a bull of this color was observed in the national park last january white buffalo though often referred to as mythical sometimes occurred these varied from gray to cream white the rare and valuable silk or beaver robe owes its name to its dark color and its peculiar sheen or gloss white or spotted robes were highly valued by the indians among the blackfeet they were presented to the sun as votive offerings other tribes kept them in their sacred bundles apart from man the buffalo had but few natural enemies of these the most destructive were the wolves which killed a great many of them these however were principally old straggling bulls for the calves were protected by their mothers and the females and young stock were so vigorous and so gregarious that they had but little to fear from this danger it is probable now notwithstanding the destruction which they wrought the wolves performed an important service for the buffalo race keeping it vigorous and healthy by killing weak disabled and superannuated animals which could no longer serve any useful purpose in the herd and yet consumed the grass which would support a healthy breeding animal it is certainly true that sick buffalo or those out of condition were rarely seen the grizzly bear fed to some extent on the carcasses of buffalo drowned in the rivers or caught in the quicksands and occasionally they caught living buffalo and killed them a blackfoot indian told me of an attempt of this kind which he witnessed he was lying hidden by a buffalo trail in the badlands near a little creek waiting for a small bunch to come down to water so that he might kill one the buffalo came on in single file as usual the leading animal being a young heifer when they had nearly reached the water and were passing under a vertical clay wall a grizzly bear lying hid on a shelf of this wall reached down and with both paws caught the heifer about the neck and threw himself upon her the others at once ran off and a short struggle ensued the bear trying to kill the heifer and she to escape almost at once however the indian saw a splendid young bull come rushing down the trail toward the scene of conflict and charge the bear knocking him down a fierce combat ensued 
the bull would charge the bear and when he struck him fairly would knock him off his feet often inflicting severe wounds with his sharp horns the bear struck at the bull and tried to catch him by the head or shoulders and to hold him but this he could not do after fifteen or twenty minutes of fierce and active fighting the bear had received all the punishment he cared for and tried to escape but the bull would not let him go and kept up the attack until he had killed his adversary even after the bear was dead the bull would gore the carcass and sometimes lift it clear of the ground on its horns he seemed insane with rage and notwithstanding the fact that most of the skin was torn from his head and shoulders appeared to be looking about for something else to fight the Indian was very much afraid lest the bull should discover and kill him, and was greatly relieved when he finally left the bear and went off to join his band. This Blackfoot had never heard of Uncle Remus' tales, but he imitated Br'er Rabbit, laid low, and said nothing. To the Indians, the buffalo was the staff of life. It was their food, clothing, dwellings, tools. The needs of a savage people are not many, perhaps, but whatever the Indians of the plains had, that the buffalo gave them. It is not strange, then, that this animal was reverenced by most plain tribes, nor that it entered largely into their sacred ceremonies, and was in a sense worshipped by them. The Pawnees, in explaining their religious customs, say, quote, Through the corn and the buffalo we worship the Father. End quote. The Blackfeet ask, what one of all the animals is most sacred and the reply given is the buffalo the robe was the indian's winter covering and his bed while the skin freed from the hair and dressed constituted his summer sheet or blanket the dressed hide was used for moccasins leggings shirts and women's dresses dressed cowskins formed the lodges the warmest and most comfortable portable shelters ever devised braided strands of rawhide furnished them with ropes and lines and these were made also from the twisted hair the green hide was sometimes used as a kettle in which to boil meat or stretched over a frame of boughs gave them coracles or boats for crossing rivers the tough thick hide of the bull's neck allowed to shrink smooth made a shield which would turn a lance thrust an arrow or even the ball of an old-fashioned smooth-bore gun from the rawhide, the hair having been shaved off, were made parfleches, envelope-like cases which served for trunks or boxes, useful to contain small articles. The cannon bones and ribs were used to make implements for dressing hides, the shoulder blades lashed to sticks made hoes and axes, and the ribs runners for small sledges drawn by dogs. The hoofs were boiled to make a glue for fastening the feathers and heads on their arrows, the hair used to stuff cushions and later saddles strands of the long black beard to ornament articles of wearing apparel and implements of war such as shields and quivers the sinews lying along the back gave them thread and bowstrings and backed their bows the horns furnished spoons and ladles and ornamented their war bonnets water buckets were made from the lining of the paunch the skin of the hind leg cut off above the pastern and again a short distance above the hock was once used for a moccasin or boot fly brushes were made from the skin of the tail dried on sticks knife sheaths quivers bow cases gun covers saddle cloths and a hundred other useful and necessary articles all were furnished by the buffalo the indians killed some smaller game as elk deer and antelope but for food their dependence was on the buffalo but before the coming of the whites their knives and arrowheads were merely sharpened stones weapons which would be inefficient against such great thick-skinned beasts even under the most favorable circumstances with these primitive implements they could not kill food in quantities sufficient to supply their needs there must be some means of taking the buffalo in considerable numbers such wholesale capture was accomplished by means of traps or surrounds which all depended for success on one characteristic of the animal its curiosity the blackfeet plains crees gross ventures of the prairie sarces 
some bands of the dakotas snakes crows and some others drove the herd of buffalo into pens from above or over high cliffs where the fall killed or crippled a large majority of the herd the cheyennes and arapahoes drove them into pens on level ground the blackfeet arakaras mandans gross ventures of the village pawnees omahas otos and others surrounded the herd in great circles on the prairie and then frightening them so that they started running kept them from breaking through the line of men and made them race round and round in a circle until they were so exhausted that they could not run away and were easily killed these primitive modes of slaughter have been described by earlier writers and frequently quoted in recent years yet in all that has been written on this subject i fail to find a single account which gives at all a true notion of the methods employed or the means by which the buffalo were brought into the enclosures eyewitnesses have been careless observers and have taken many things for granted my understanding of this matter is derived from men who from childhood have been familiar with these things and from them during years of close association i have again and again heard the story of these old hunting methods the blackfoot trap was called the piscu it was an enclosure one side of which was formed by the vertical wall of a cut bank the others being built of rocks logs poles and brush six or eight feet high it was not necessary that these walls should be very strong but they had to be tight so that the buffalo could not see through them from a point on the cut bank above the enclosure in two diverging lines stretching far out into the prairie piles of rock were heaped up at short intervals or bushes were stuck in the ground forming the wings of a v-shaped chute which would guide any animals running down the chute to its angle above the piskun when a herd of buffalo were feeding near at hand the people prepared for the hunt in which almost the whole camp took part it is commonly stated that the buffalo were driven into the piskun by mounted men but this was not the case they were not driven but led and they were led by an appeal to their curiosity the man who brought them was usually the possessor of a buffalo rock a talisman which was believed to give him greater power to call the buffalo than was had by others the previous night was spent by this man in praying for success in the enterprise of the morrow the help of the sun napi and all above people was asked for and sweet grass was burned to them early in the morning without eating or drinking the man started away from the camp and went up on the prairie before he left the lodge he told his wives that they must not go out or even look out of the lodge during his absence they should stay there and pray to the sun for his success and burn sweet grass until he returned when he left the camp and went up on to the prairie toward the buffalo all the people followed him and distributed themselves along the wings of the chute hiding behind the piles of rock or brush the caller sometimes wore a robe and a bull's head bonnet or at times was naked when he had approached close to the buffalo he endeavored to attract their attention by moving about wheeling round and round and alternately appearing and disappearing the feeding buffalo soon began to raise their heads and stare at him and presently the nearest one would walk toward him to discover what this strange creature might be and the others would follow as they began to approach the man withdrew toward the entrance of the chute if the buffalo began to trot he increased his speed and before very long he had the herd well within the wings as soon as they had passed the first pile of rocks behind which some people were concealed the indians sprang into view and by yelling and waving robes frightened the hindmost of the buffalo which then began to run down the chute as they passed along more and more people showed themselves and added to the terror and in a very short time the herd was in a headlong stampede guided toward the angle above the piskun by the piles of rock on either side about the walls of the piskun now full of buffalo were distributed the women and children of the camp who leaning over the enclosure waving their arms and calling out did all they could to frighten the penned-in animals and to keep them from pushing against the walls or trying to jump or climb over them as a rule the buffalo raced around within the enclosure and the men shot them down as they passed until all were killed after this the people all entered the piskun and cut up the dead transporting the meat to camp 
the skulls bones and less perishable offal were removed from the enclosure and the wolves coyotes foxes and badgers devoured what was left it occasionally happened that something occurred to turn the buffalo so that they passed through the guiding arms and escaped usually they went on straight to the angle and jumped over the cliff into the enclosure below in winter when snow was on the ground their straight course was made additionally certain by placing on or just above the snow a line of buffalo chips leading from the angle of the v midway between its arms out on to the prairie these dark objects only twenty or thirty feet apart were easily seen against the white snow and the buffalo always followed them no doubt thinking this a trail where another herd had passed by the six Sikau tribe of the blackfoot nation and the plains crees the piskun was built in a somewhat different way but the methods employed were similar with these people who inhabited a flat country the enclosure was built of logs and near a timbered stream its circular wall was complete that is there was no opening or gateway in it but at one point this wall everywhere eight feet high was cut away so that its height was only four feet from this point a bridge or causeway of logs covered with dirt sloped by a gradual descent down to the level of the prairie this bridge was fenced on either side with logs and the arms of the v came together at the point where the bridge reached the ground the buffalo were driven down the chute as before ran up on this bridge and were forced to leap into the pen as soon as all had entered indians who had been concealed nearby ran up and put poles across the opening through which the buffalo had passed and over these poles hung robes so as to entirely conceal the outer world then the butchering of the animals took place further to the south out on the prairie where timber and rocks and brush were not obtainable for making traps like these simpler but less effective methods were adopted the people would go out on the prairie and conceal themselves in a great circle open on one side then some man would approach the buffalo and decoy them into the circle men would now show themselves at different points and start the buffalo running in a circle yelling and waving robes to keep them from approaching or trying to break through the ring of men this had to be done with great judgment however for often if the herd got started in one direction it was impossible to turn it and it would rush through the ring and none would be secured sometimes if a herd was found in a favorable position and there was no wind a large camp of people would set up their lodges all about the buffalo in which case the chances of success in the surround were greatly increased the tribes which used the piskun also practiced driving the buffalo over high rough cliffs where the fall crippled or killed most of the animals which went over in such situations no enclosure was built at the foot of the precipice in the latter days of the piskun in the north the man who brought the buffalo often went to them on horseback riding a white horse he would ride backward and forward before them zigzagging this way and that and after a little they would follow him he never attempted to drive but always led them the driving began only after the herd had passed the outer rock piles and the people had begun to rise up and frighten them this method of securing meat has been practiced in montana within thirty years and even more recently among the plains crees of the north i have seen the remains of old piskuns and the guiding wings of the chute and have talked with many men who have taken part in such killings all this had to do of course with the primitive methods of buffalo killing as soon as horses became abundant and sheet iron arrowheads and later guns were secured by the indians these old practices began to give way to the more exciting pursuit of running buffalo and of surrounding them on horseback of this modern method as practiced twenty years ago and exclusively with the bow and arrow i have already written at some length in another place to the white travelers on the plains in early days the buffalo furnished support and sustenance their abundance made fresh meat easily obtainable and the early travelers usually carried with them bundles of dried meat or sacks of pemmican food made from the flesh of the buffalo that contained a great deal of nutriment in very small bulk robes were used for bedding and in winter buffalo moccasins were worn for warmth the hair side within 
coats of buffalo skin are the warmest covering known the only garment which will present an effective barrier to the bitter blasts that sweep over the plains of the northwest perhaps as useful to early travelers as any product of the buffalo was the buffalo chip or dried dung this being composed of comminuted woody fiber of the grass made an excellent fuel and in many parts of the treeless plains was the only substance which could be used to cook with the dismal story of the extermination of the buffalo for its hides has been so often told that i may be spared the sickening details of the butchery which was carried on from the mexican to the british boundary line in the struggle to obtain a few dollars by the most ignoble means as soon as railroads penetrated the buffalo country a market was opened for the hides men too lazy to work were not too lazy to hunt and a good hunter could kill in the early days from thirty to seventy-five buffalo a day the hides of which were worth from a dollar fifty to four dollars each this seemed an easy way to make money and the market for hides was unlimited up to this time the trade in robes had been mainly confined to those dressed by the indians and these were for the most part taken from cows the coming of the railroad made hides of all sorts marketable and even those taken from naked old bulls found a sale at some price the butchery of buffalo was now something stupendous thousands of hunters followed millions of buffalo and destroyed them wherever found and at all seasons of the year they pursued them during the day and at night camped at the watering places and built lines of fires along the streams to drive the buffalo back so that they could not drink it took less than six years to destroy all the buffalo in kansas nebraska indian territory and northern texas the few that were left of the southern herd retreated to the waterless plains of texas and there for a while had a brief respite even here the hunters followed them but as the animals were few and the territory in which they ranged vast they held out here for some years it was in this country and against the last survivors of this southern herd that buffalo jones made his successful trips to capture calves the extirpation of the northern herd was longer delayed no very terrible slaughter occurred until the completion of the northern pacific railroad then however the same scenes of butchery were enacted buffalo were shot down by tens of thousands their hides stripped off and the meat left to the wolves the result of the crusade was soon seen and the last buffalo were killed in the northwest near the boundary line in eighteen eighty three and that year may be said to have finished up the species though some few were killed in eighteen eighty four and eighteen eighty five after the slaughter had been begun but years before it had been accomplished the subject was brought to the attention of congress and legislation looking to the preservation of the species was urged upon that body little interest was taken in the subject but in eighteen seventy four after much discussion congress did pass an act providing for the protection of the buffalo this bill however was never signed by the president End of section twelve.